So good afternoon, everybody. Huh? I already did. So there are a lot of students, I think. The lights, yes, let's turn on. Yeah. This one, okay. So the title is interesting, and let's try and convince you that it's true, that actually quantum vacuum is nothing, but it actually does something, okay? So we'll see. So the seminar is uh, basically split up into these uh, different subjects. So we'll start by just giving you an idea of how the idea of vacuum changed at the beginning of the 1900s with the discovery of quantum mechanics and the relativistic quantum mechanics. And then uh, we'll discuss just quickly the vacuum energy and uh, the speed of light. Uh, then we will discuss what's called vacuum magnetic biorefringence, which is related to the speed of light. And we'll see uh, how these are, two are connected. And this is the basic... Uh, this magnetic biofringence is the basic subject of the experiment that I've been working on now from 25 years more, actually. Uh, the main subject of the experiment that we, I worked on, the PV loss experiment, was uh, dedicated to measuring this small effect that we will discuss in a moment. We'll show you how this experiment uh, did not succeed and why. A new proposal that we tried a few years ago, but then we had to give up there too and how now we've entered in uh, Einstein Telescope, the new future gravitational wave antenna that's going to be built uh, hopefully in Sardinia, but uh, which may help us uh, develop some new optics, which will then allow us to do this measurement here in Ferrara, hopefully someday. So the idea of uh, a vacuum, which, oops, this is MC squared. Okay, I made a mistake in, at the last minute, but anyways. The idea of vacuum um, at the beginning 1900s uh, changed because of these three discoveries. The first was the equivalence of mass and energy, Einstein's E equals MC squared. Then we have a Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And then we have a little bit later in 1928, the uh, uh, relativistic equation for the electron, which predicted, and this was the, the sort of the strange thing about it, this doesn't work anymore, predicted uh, negative energy states. Okay, and then later on, a few later, years later, these negative energy states were identified as antimatter. And so basically what you have now is that you have energy fluctuations, you have the equivalence between mass and energy, so you can have mass fluctuations, and this allows you to produce in, in vacuum, for example, virtual electron positron pairs, or you can also have just directly photons. So basically the idea of vacuum now is that it's a, a minimum energy state, and given that it's a minimum energy state, it can fluctuate, okay? So this vacuum now is no longer a steady state system where nothing happens. It's actually very, very dynamic, and uh, it fluctuates continuously. So just to give you an idea, the energy, because as you get new discoveries, you may have new problems. And here we have a huge problem, okay? A gigantic problem. Now, if you take the Planck's collaboration, Planck is an experiment, a satellite, which measured the anisotropy of microwave background from the universe. And they were able, by studying the expansion of the universe, to determine what's a, a, an average energy density of vacuum, which you can convert into, an in a, into a mass per unit volume, okay? So they measured with this experiment, this was published in 2015, it, they measured this value here. Just as a comparison, the density of a neutron star is many orders of magnitude larger. It's very dense, a neutron star. But if you go and calculate from first principle, you calculate the energy density of vacuum, which comes up due to fluctuations of vacuum, okay, you get this incredibly large number, which is 10 orders of magnitude more dense than a neutron star, which makes no sense at all. Okay? Now, it makes no sense if this energy density actually has a physical effect. For example, if it gravitates. If it doesn't gravitate, it's not a problem. If it gravitates, it's a huge problem. And indeed, already at the beginning of the 1900s, NERNs, just without considering electron positrons or today Higgs fluctuations or anything else, okay, they just considered electromagnetic energy, photons, and they put a natural, because you have to sum if you remember, you studied the, the, the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator, its ground state, has an energy one half h bar omega. Okay? 
So if you sum all of these energies for photons and you put a cutoff frequency to avoid infinities at the classical radius of the electron, then you get here too a huge energy, 10 to the 17 kilograms per cubic meter. And the universe, as Pauli said, beginning in this last century, he said the universe would have been 31 kilometers in diameter. So there's obviously a complete crazy problem here. Still today, it's not solved. People don't have an answer, and it's this cosmological constant problem. Okay, so this is, comes directly from the way the vacuum fluctuates. So the question is, first of all, have these macroscopic, macroscopic effects due to fluctuations ever been measured? This is the first question. And so one of the answers is yes, because in the 1948 here, Casimir, I don't know if you've heard of Casimir's effect, but Casimir calculated that if you have two parallel plate conductors in vacuum without anything, and you have vacuum fluctuations of photons, which are these little lines that you see here, given that the conductor must obey the boundary conditions of, of zero potential, it does not accept inside between the two plates, it does not accept certain modes of oscillation of the electromagnetic field. And so those fields are pushed out. So you have an imbalance between the outer radiation and the inner radiation. This produces a force, an attractive force between two conducting plates in vacuum. Okay, and this was first calculated. And indeed, in 2002, a group, a group of people in, uh, in Legnaro, Bressi, Carugno, Ruoz, these people, they did a first measurement for parallel plate uh, 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 conductors, which indeed attract each other. So there is a real effect due to these vacuum fluctuations. And here, you're just measuring the difference between the inside and the outside. You're not measuring an absolute value. Then the next question is, OK, so these fluctuations really exist. They produce a physical effect, which is an attraction between these two plates. The next question is, if these vacuum fluctuations have a weight, do they gravitate? This is the big problem. Do they gravitate? And this, as I said before, was already posed by Nernst in 1916, whether just the electromagnetic radiation from the zero point energy, whether this had actually a weight to it. So now, today, it started a few years ago, there's an experiment financed by Anifan um, called Archimedes. And this experiment would like to measure the, the, the effect on the weight of a pair of, of parallel well, I'll explain now, of parallel non-conducting, which can be transformed into conducting su surfaces, okay? Whether, when they're conduct non-conducting, the radiation is everywhere, and you don't expect this to have any particular uh, difference between uh, the vacuum and the, the, the oscillations of the vacuum are everywhere. But the moment you make these plates conducting, again, you have what happened with the Casimir effect, that you can only accept certain oscillations inside. So these are inside the two plates when these become superconducting, the radiation is pushed out. And the question is, does this system and this system, do they weigh the same amount? So they want to measure the difference in weight between these two systems. And so what they're developing, and this, this is actually being built in Sardinia, in Sardinia because Sardinia is one of the most stable, low noise, seismical, uh, areas in all of Europe. I don't know if it's even the world, but uh, it's it's a very, very quiet place. Okay, And so that's where they're doing this experiment. So the idea is to have on one side of this balance, you have something which is just a dielectric me media, which doesn't do anything. On the other side, you have these two plates, which by changing the temperature, you can make them trans uh, transit from superconducting to non-superconducting and then superconducting, non-superconducting. And you want to see if this balance begins to move like this back and forth due to the difference in weight between this system where the radiation has been pushed out and this system where the radiation is back in. So you know, suppose you find a negative Can you claim that this is a violation of this one that you want to see? Yeah, yeah. That's, I was thinking about this today, yeah. okay? I was, exactly, I wanted to phone him and ask him. <laughs> okay, I wanted to, but your experiment, if you find something, does this mean that you're violating the equivalence principle? The strong, strong side. You know, the strong side. I think so. Yeah, I, I think too, but I, I love it. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. 
it's 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 a very difficult experiment because they have to use these superconductors. And there's a lot of solid state physics in here. This is the principle of it, and we'll see what comes up. But I completely agree. I was thinking about just yesterday when I was preparing these slides, but this thing has to be you gotta ask. Yeah. So that's as far as electromagnetic fields go. But what about charged particles with a mass? Huh? We discussed before that indeed with the Dirac's equation, you can produce positrons. So you have electron positron pairs. And how do these affect physical uh, measurements that have been done in the, in the past? Now, there's a series of measurements that indeed have been made. These are all microscopic. So you have the lamp shift in hydrogen between two states, which in principle are degenerate. But if you go and introduce what happens due to vacuum, so you have the self interaction of electron. You have vacuum polarization of the electron positron virtual pairs. These change the states, and this has been measured. This is called the Lamb shift. The other one is Delbruck scattering, where you have high energy gamma rays uh, scattering off of high Z nuclei. And you have to consider this, this diagram here, where these crosses indicate the electric Coulomb field <coughs> of the atom, and this is the gamma that's coming in and scattering out. Then you have the G minus two. This is another famous measurement. G is the, the, the factor that, in, in principle, for a Dirac particle should be exactly two. Whereas if you measure G minus two, so you're subtracting the two, you get what's left behind. And this is a small value, but it's been measured. And then you have light by light scattering here. In this case, it's virtual photons where they had at LHC, this was done just a few years ago. You have leadlet scattering and they exchange virtual gamma rays. And then they see coming out real gamma rays, which were produced from the scattering. Now, all these are microscopic things. Now, what we're interested, though, is how do these effects here produce an effect on the propagation of light? So is the speed of light still equal to C? Is there something else happening? Now, as soon as this idea of vacuum fluctuations came up, already in the 1930s, Halperin, he wrote down a very short paper. This is about half of the article, OK, where he says radiation phenomena are of particular interest. And he said, we're seeking the scattering properties of vacuum. So as the light was propagating, you want to see what happens just because of the presence of the vacuum. And he also adds that it's interesting that the photons that you're using are below the mass of the electron so that you're not producing real pairs. You're still uh, searching for the interaction of light in vacuum, but with the virtual pair, only virtual pairs. So this is basically what we've been working on. And just to explain how this whole thing has come up, if you start from classical electromagnetism, we know that these are Maxwell's equations in a medium. If you start from the free field Lagrangian without any materials or charges or anything, this is a classical Lagrangian density. You can calculate from these constitutive equations, you can calculate the value of V and H, which comes here, just by taking the derivatives of the Lagrangian. And what you find is that the D minus epsilon zero E is just the polarization, which is zero. And the same goes for the magnetization. So you have a vacuum system here where there's no polarization, there's no magnetization. So there's no structure. And classically, a vacuum is completely structural. So there's nothing there. Okay. So what happened instead at the beginning in 1930s? What happened was um, that Ehler and Koppel, two students of Heisenberg, they actually calculated the first correction to the classical Lagrangian. This is the classical Lagrangian, and this is the first correction that they introduced due to the existence of positron, uh, electron positron pairs in vacuum. Okay, so this is a four field interaction. Here you have four electron, this is squared, this is squared, so you have four fields, there too you have four fields. So you have a four photon interaction in, in vacuum. Now this is of particular interest because it's written up there. Still today, nobody has verified QED where you have only photons, real photons in the input and the output. And the other thing is whether this actually, it should, it should produce a microscopic effect, which is on the speed of light, and we'll see this in a moment. But this has never been measured yet. It's a very small effect, but uh, it's of interest because of that. Now, it's a very small effect because you see the parameter which determines the entity of the, there's this four field interaction is given here. 
And it's a number which is 10 to the minus 24 Tesla to the minus 2. And we'll see in a moment that this results in a very, very small effect. In fact, it's never been seen before yet. You say in vacuum, but you have external fields. Huh? You say in vacuum, but you have external fields. Exactly. Yeah. So but that's, we'll, come to, we'll discuss this in a moment. Okay. Okay. Because this comes to down to saying, what is vacuum? Right. How do you define vacuum? This is exactly the question. And how do you define the speed of light? Okay. So just a pictorial view of what we're trying to do is, is, is if in general you have a real photon which is propagating in vacuum, and as we've seen, there are virtual pairs and a bunch of other things happening. So you have a bare photon that's doing nothing, you have virtual pairs, it does a bunch of other things, and all of this together results in the speed of light, which is what we measure. When you apply an external field, which means that you're searching for an interaction between Two electromagnetic fields in vacuum okay in the vacuum in the sense that there's no material here what you're doing is you're you're coupling to these these blobs of electron positron pairs and this affects the speed of light and it changes the speed of light and what we find and i'll show you in a moment is that the speed of light depends on the, how strong the external field is and it also depends on the polarization of light okay so I'm not going to do, I'm just putting these here for, uh, for your reference. But what you can see immediately is this, is that you, you take the Lagrangian I just, I just uh, wrote down. And here you see, for example, if I subtract D minus epsilon zero E, the rest of the stuff that you have over here is the polarization vector. This here. All of this is a polarization vector. So this means that vacuum can be polarized. Not only, but what you find here is that your vector D now depends not only on the electric, external electric field, but also on external magnetic field. It's all mixed up. So your medium is no longer linear. It's a completely nonlinear medium. The effect is very small, but it's completely nonlinear. Now, if you consider now an, an experimental situation, which is what we're using here in Ferrara, you have a beam of light which is going through a magnetic field. And you have the magnetic field, which defines, and you'll see why in a moment, it defines a direction which is parallel and another direction which is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And if you send in light polarized at a certain angle with respect to the magnetic field, and by using these equations here, you can determine the dielectric constant, relative dielectric constant, the permeability of vacuum with uh, polarization parallel and perpendicular to the magnetic field. And then you can calculate the index of refractions. Now, what you see here is that the index of refraction, not only it's no longer equal to one, the index of refraction now depends on the external magnetic field, but it also depends on the, whether the polarization is parallel or if it's perpendicular to the magnetic field. Here you have seven and here you have four. So there's a difference. Vacuum becomes like a crystal. It's birefringent. It means that the index of refraction along two perpendicular directions is different. And this is uh, what we are trying to use to try to measure this effect. Because in the end, you have that the medium, in this case, vacuum with a magnetic field, is birefringent. And so it has these two uh, directions with respect to the magnetic field. But it's also true that here, the index of refraction is never equal to 1. There's always a small difference from equal to 1. And the difference from 1, uh, n minus 1, if you like, is a border of AB squared. Now, remember, A is 10 to minus 24. So if you have a, a magnetic field of 1 Tesla, for example, the index of refraction is changing by 10 to the minus 24, which is uh, it's a number you just, in absolute values, there's no way you can measure it. The only way you can measure something so small is to invent a differential measurement, where you have a bunch of stuff which is just subtracted out, and you try to measure a difference. So there are two ways. One is what we are doing is to make a polarimeter. So you measure and we'll see why the, the, the difference directly of the index of refraction. And the other, which um, sometimes somebody has proposed, we've also proposed it, but it's never been considered seriously yet by the, the, the scientific community, is to put a magnetic field on a gravitational wave antenna, which is a huge interferometer. So this is measuring the difference in the length between two arms. Rather than the length, it's the optical path, which is the index of refraction <coughs> times the length. 
So there's two ways. You have to, in any case, have a differential measurement. So what we've done in Ferrara, or we started in other places, but now it's in Ferrara, what we want to do is try to measure this birefringence directly. So that's the basic uh, subject, but let me just say what else could happen. So these are the diagrams that we are looking for. This is direct light by light scattering. This is the birefringence. So you have a magnetic field, a classical field, and you have a magnetic field, uh, excuse me, the photon, which is interacting with the magnetic field, okay? Now, this is the basic <laughs> scheme that we're trying to measure. But remember, vacuum is fluctuating. So it can fluctuate into anything, anything which is actually real and exists, which means we can also search for what have been hypothesized, which is really charged particles, which may have a fractional charge, a smaller mass. The system can, the, the, the equations are exactly the same, just the charge and the mass are different. But in principle, it can produce an effect. Then you have uh, cor corrections, which if, first you have to be able to measure the effect, and then it's, it's about a one and a half percent effect, which is difficult, but in principle, it should be measurable. Then you have hot, uh, strong interaction fluctuation, but this is way too small for us. But the other thing that's interesting is that we're looking for any sort of, um, of change in index of refraction between two uh, perpendicular axes. And one of the things that can happen is that you can look for axioms. Axioms is one of the candidates for dark matter. And uh, the technique that we've uh, worked on now, uh, actually, it, it, it's still, together with another experiment, it's still the best uh, limit on the existence of axions measured in a laboratory. Okay? So this is also another thing that we, we study. But let me go quickly. So the first proposal to measure vacuum magnetic birefringence in vacuum was uh, done at CERN. Jacob, Enrico Jacopini and Mino Zavattini. If you're asking yourself, yes, this was my father. Okay. He was working at CERN at the time. So they're the ones who proposed this experiment by, uh, for, for the first time. Okay. They had been working on lamp shift for many years, and they had studied vacuum. And then they realized that the, the whole idea had reached its end and that they had to find something else to study photon-photon interactions. And so what came up was to measure vacuum magnetic biofringence. And so they proposed a scheme. And I must say today, the scheme, although a lot of uh, people have tried to describe other schemes to measure, what they proposed at the time is still the best way to do it. Okay. At the moment, it's still the best way. So this is just a quick time scheme of how the whole experiment started. So in the 19, at the end of 1979, 1983, they did their first test just to see how feasible it was. Then we had this first experiment here in Brookhaven. Um, I was still young at the time. Uh, and this was done at the Brookhaven National Laboratories. And here, the real uh, objective of the experiment was the axion. The, they had been financed to try to detect the axions using a polarimeter, which is, at the time was new. It was the first time that uh, the Petroncio my father and then other people have proposed uh, this idea of measuring the existence of axions through optical techniques. Then after that, PD last started in 1992. Uh, and then from then on, it maintained its name until 2019. And it had different stages here in Lignaro near Padova. We had a superconducting magnet. I, this is when I joined, 1992. And then in Ferrara, I started because it wasn't working in Lignaro, it was too complicated with this uh, superconducting magnet. So slowly I put up an optical bench in Ferrara, began to do some testing. And in the end, we, uh, we put together a small polarimeter, uh, a test polarimeter, but it was able to do uh, better than this experiment here. And so that taught us that actually using the technique, and I'll show you what this is here, it was a good one. So then we had a, a bigger magnets that we were given. But nonetheless, uh, this experiment didn't succeed. And so then we proposed another one and I will show you what we were proposing. And that also didn't work. <laughs> so, it's a bit of a, but okay. So let's discuss uh, what you measure because birefringence is a local uh, uh, quantity in, of a medium, okay? You don't measure directly birefringence. You have to measure ellipticity. The ellipticity is what's induced by birefringence. Now, the ellipticity works like this. 
if you come into a birefringent medium where you have two different axes and you have an electric field coming with a certain angle with respect to these two axes, you can decompose this vector here into to a perpendicular and a parallel direction. So they become two independent fields which are propagating. Now, this, <laughs> given that these two indices of refraction are different, you have a phase delay of one with respect to the other when it comes out. So when these then uh, come together again, they're out of phase. They're no longer in phase. If they were in phase, it would remain a linear polarization. Now they're out of phase. And so the, polariz the, the electric field actually describes an ellipse. And so you have an elliptical polarization. And the ratio of the minor axis to the major axis is what's called the ellipticity of the, of the, of the polarization. Okay? This is just a, a few calculations just to show you. But the basic concept is this, is that after a medium you have a different phase along these two directions, of, uh, excuse me, with the polarization along these two directions. And when they sum up again, they have a phase delay which produces an ellipticity. And this ellipticity is, the expression is this, is this here. You have the birefringence multiplied by the length of the medium. Then you have a factor pi over lambda. And then you have the dependence on two times the angle between the axis and the polarization. Okay. So if you want to measure this uh, ellipticity due to uh, vacuum magnetic birefringence, what do you do? Well, the expression is here. So you have to make this as large as you can. And to do that, you have to make the length as long as you can. In principle, you want to make this also as small as you can. And there are technical reasons why in the end you just use visible light. Some people have, produced, have um, actually proposed using x-rays, but that's a different, different question. Delta N is defined by the, the Lagrangian and the external magnetic field, which you're applying here. So this is a basic expression. N, you want to try and make this as large as you can. And this, you want to make as large as you can by making B squared times L as much as you can. These are the, the, the ingredients that you can work on. So as, as you saw, um, the, the PV last experiment had different phases. Then there are other experiments here. VFRT was the Brookhaven one. Then you have Q&A, which is an experiment in Taiwan. You have BMV and all of these. Are, this is a French and a, and a Japanese collaboration. Now, here for magnetic fields, you have three choices, either a superconducting magnet, either a permanent magnet, or a, non a, no a normal conducting magnet. These are the three choices that you can, you can try to use. And all of these have been uh, have been uh, considered by the different collaborations. So at the beginning, PV last was using a, um, a, high, uh, a superconducting magnet, and the whole thing was rotating with the cryostat, with liquid helium inside. Everything was rotating. This this was done in linear. Um, uh, that, I think you were were you still director at the time in linear. So uh, Professor Dan Piaz was uh, director of linear at the time, and he sustained this experiment. And uh, the problem here was uh, the helium, liquid helium. Liquid helium is, uh, is expensive. Uh, you need a lot of uh, energy also to keep it liquid. Um, and so we had a very low duty cycle. The other possibility are permanent magnets. Now, permanent magnets have a limit on the maximum magnetic field that you can get. But the advantage on the other side is that it's permanently there. There's, the field is always there. Um, so you have a duty cycle of one. You can rotate the magnet to have a modulation in the magnetic field, and I'll explain that why in a moment. But you need to modulate the magnetic field. And you can go up to relatively, compared to the superconducting magnets, you can go up to higher frequencies. And then you have these normal conducting magnets, which are very low fields if you want continuous field. But you can have a pulse field in a few milliseconds, and this gives up, can go up to 20 tesla. And this is what these two collaborations in, in Toulouse and in, in uh, Tokyo are trying to use. But here, again, you have a very difficult question, which is the duty cycle. So how long is the field actually on in one hour? It's a few milliseconds, that's all. They can only have a pulse every quarter of an hour, so it's, it's really a problem. So we opted for the permanent magnet. These are the two magnets that we have here in Ferrara. They have 2.5 Tesla. Each one is about 85 centimeters long, so we have almost two meters of the magnet. Um, the construction is what's called the Halbach configuration, which means that if you have magnetized uh, little magnets that are put around in this form here, 
the fields all add up inside and outside in principle you have zero field so there's very very there's no field on the outside all the field is concentrated inside okay inside the board and this can be rotated now we rotated them to 23 hertz it's a half a ton each magnet and it's quite impressive so we <laughs> slowed down um, we also had mechanical problems with resonances and so on so we never were actually worked at this frequency but uh, it can in principle so that was the magnet choice, permanent magnets, 2.5 tesla. Then the other thing we need to do is to try to um, extract the ellipticity, which is induced by the magnetic field in the best way possible. Now, all of you have learned to, uh, that if you have two cross polarizers, okay, and you put them together, in general, if this ellipticity psi is equal to zero, you always have a little bit of light coming through the polarizers. It's just the extinction ratio. If you buy a polarizer from, from your, your sunglasses or so, or the, the, the plastic ones, this factor sigma squared might be 100. If you get good polarizers made out of crystals, calcite crystals, this can be down to 10 to minus 7. Okay, okay so that's a, that's the blackest thing that you can find is due to the polarizers. Now you add the ellipticity and what you see is that when you come through and you have an ellipticity, which is the electric field, remember it's the ratio of the, of the minor to minor, major axis in the electric field, not in the intensity. This is the electric field. When you measure the intensity, the power output, then you have to take the square of this quantity. Now, you imagine having an ellipticity which is much less than 10 to minus 15. So you do the square, you have 10 to minus 30. You'll never measure this. It's impossible. So what you do instead is uh, an interesting thing. You have to add with the modulator, you add a known ellipticity, which is a time dependent. And then you try to modulate your magnetic field at another frequency. And these two together when you add them up, because your light comes in here, it sees your magnetic field and it acquires an ellipticity. Then it sees this, and this <laughs> modulator adds the ellipticity. So the two are added up algebraically. Now you take the square of this, just like we did up there, but you take the square of the complete ellipticity, and you find that there's a double product here, and this double product makes the ellipticity linear. It's no longer square here. Here's the square. Here it's linear, and this allows you to gain many, many orders of magnitude. Not only, but these functions now are time dependent. This was static, these are now time dependent. And so this allows you to go and search for signals at a very specific frequency. And this is known as the heterodyne technique. Okay, this is known as heterodyne. So this is, maybe I won't get into details, but one thing I have to say, when you have any optical system, Besides the ellipticity which you want to measure and the modulator which we have put, there's always are other ellipticities coming from any optical element. Anything that is transverse uh, uh, where light goes through, it will always acquire an ellipticity. Nothing is absolute. Liquids are non biofilm Otherwise, any solid glass transparent is always biofilm And so you'll always have to work also with the presence of alpha, which are biofringences, which are due to the polarizers, which are due to the, the modulator, with anything, okay? And so this comes up that you have another double product, which is a problem for us, but we try to keep this under the control. But this is also a, a, a signal which you, you find in your, in your system. So let me just go back one slide just to make sure this is... Here you have a modulated uh, modulator at a certain frequency. This also has a certain frequency. When you multiply two cosines, you get what are called sidebands. So the product of two cosines at two different frequencies will produce two sidebands at the sum and the difference of the two frequencies. So you have two different frequencies. And so in the, in the end, the, the way the, the system works in, in the lab downstairs is this, is that if you do the Fourier spectrum of the, the power coming out of the system, you have a Fourier spectrum which looks like this. You have a peak here, which is due to alpha. You have these, these curves here, which are also due to alpha, which are slowly changing in time. And this is the, the problem for us. And then you have the sidebands, which are your signal. And then you have this here, which is the square 
of the modulation, which allows us to measure directly how much we are actually modulating. So this is the basic functioning of the whole thing that we have downstairs. We don't use this spectrum here. What we do is we do another thing that is just technical. We demodulate the, the Fourier spectrum, the, the intensity, excuse me. We demodulate the intensity at the frequency of the modulator and at the second harmonic of the modulator. This allows us to have a spectrum which is just half of it like this. And it's, it's at zero and this allows you to do other things that I won't get into now. But the basic idea is this, okay? So that's as far as the magnetic field and the heterodyne The other thing that we have is the optical path multiplier. How do we increase the effective length inside the magnetic field? So what we use is a Fabry-Perot interferometer. Fabry-Perot interferometer is uh, built of two mirrors. And uh, the mirrors we have our uh, reflectivity can go up to 99.9995%. Okay, so you say you send light on such a mirror and you say, what's going to go through? Nothing. In fact, nothing goes through. But in one condition, it does. And the condition is if inside these two mirrors, if the distance between the two is a multiple of the, of the frequency, the wavelength of the light, then what happens is that this tiny amount of light, this 0 0.00 few parts per million that actually gets in, is trapped. And it begins to reflect back and forth inside the sink. Other light which arrives, it also goes through and goes into the into the into the Fabi Perot. And what happens if the distance is a multiple of the wavelength? These two tiny amounts which have been which have gone inside, they add up and they have constructive interference. And this happens, goes on and on and on until inside you build up a huge field. Okay, there's a huge standing wave here in such a way that even if these mirrors are incredibly reflective, there's light coming out and you can use this light to measure. And the light which is inside here is trapped. It's trapped for a long time. And this time it's trapped is equivalent to having a very long distance where the light is traversing the magnetic field. And the, the actual, the factor that you find is this, but okay, it's a little formula, one for R, R squared is the reflectivity here divided by one minus r squared. And you see the amplification comes here because one minus r squared, r squared is almost equal to one. So this is very small. And so you have a huge amplification. But the fact that it multiplies the number of passes, you can see it because if you turn off the laser, once you have this condition of resonance, if you turn off the laser, you see light coming out of the system for milliseconds. Milliseconds means hundreds of thousands, a thousand kilometers. So in our lab downstairs, when you have the light and the Fabri Perot is actually functioning correctly, so the laser is locked in such a way that there's always an, uh, an, uh, um, an integer number of wavelengths between the mirrors, then when you switch off the laser, this trapped light slowly comes out. And it's as if the light has traveled hundreds of kilometers and you see this decay. And this is the multiplication factor that we need to increase the sensitivity of the system. So we had half a million. So it's as if the poor light was bouncing back half a million times okay, through the magnetic field. So this is the final scheme that we set up. The signal is this, as, as I said, you have the product of modulator with the magnetic field, which is rotating. Here you have the noise, okay, uh, which is coming from all the optical elements. And then you have other terms. Now, the important thing here is it's written here. What we found after many, many years is that the real cause of this noise, the dominant cause of this noise, are the mirrors themselves, the part of the reflective coating of the mirrors. And that's what, in the end, uh, made us uh, stop the experiment because we couldn't find any solution to this. But and nonetheless, ah, here, let me just show you some pictures. So you can see it later if you're interested. These are the two magnets uh, that can rotate together. Um, the laser is back here, comes around. Here you have the first polarizer. Here you have the mirror of the, of the cavity. Here you have the second mirror. And here you have the, the rest of the detection. Okay, And the light, light bounces back and forth. There's a glass tube passing through the magnet. And you have a high, high vacuum, uh, 10 to minus 8 millibar. So it's 10 to minus 11 atmospheres is the vacuum inside here. This is another picture of the lab. This is from one side, the entrance. 
Here we have the glass tube going through the magnets. Here we have to make sure that the, mag the tube was actually centered inside the magnet. And to do this, we had accelerometers measuring if the tube was moving due to the magnetic field. And so it was centered properly so that there was no forces. And this is just a side view. Then you have the output. This is where you have light coming out and then it comes out this way. There's amplifiers the other side. Ah, uh, here, there's a little, the TV here is showing that the, the cavity is actually functioning. You can't, maybe you can't see it from here. But, okay. So this is when we were actually doing the measurements. So just to, um, to, to show you that the system actually works, if you take any gas and you apply a magnetic field, it will also become biofriendly. The effect is very small. It's called photon photon effect. Okay. And it's used to calibrate the, the whole system to see if everything that you've done is correct. Helium is the gas that has the smallest effect. And we were able to measure the photon photon effect of helium down to 32 microbars. Yeah? Of pressure, which nobody else has ever measured such a small uh, effect. And in fact, here is, uh, as I was saying before, but this is the one sided Fourier spectrum. But we'll now, this peak here indicates the biofringence that we're measuring, the ellipticity that we're measuring. And this peak corresponds to a biofringence of 4, 4, 10 to the minus 20. So we can measure, we were able to measure 10 to the minus 20. Remember, we need to go to 10 to the minus 23. So this is obviously not enough. But still, 10 to the minus 20 is, is pretty small. Okay. And these are the final results that we were able to do here in Ferrara compared to other experiments around the world. So this is the first Brookhaven experiment that was done with superconducting magnets. This is a PV last experiment that was done in Legnaro with a superconducting magnet that was rotating. Then this is a small test apparatus that we did here in Ferrara. This was the first attempt to use permanent magnets. This is the pulsed magnets in Toulouse. This is the pulse magnet in, in Tokyo. And these are the results that we published. Uh, at, this is the first result and we, in, we continued measuring and continued measuring. And this is the best result that we got, okay? This green line is the expected value that you want to find. Now, here you see we have a central variable and we have the error. And the error contains, contains the, the actual value, which means that we measured zero and the zero had an error, and the error contained the, the actual value we wanted to measure. So we didn't see any. These other people, these three, us two, so two sigma, uh, these people, you see their error is smaller. It never goes to zero, which means that they had systematic errors, okay, which they did not control properly, and that made them measure an effect within the error, okay? And they, the, the us too, we published. This, ours, if you put two sigma, these are one sigma errors. If you go two sigma, it goes to zero. So these are zero to two sigma. This was three sigma. This was much more. So these experiments are extremely difficult. You have to control the systematic error. But this is where we got to, and we weren't able to do any better. Now, why didn't we get to, to do the measurement? Um, this is another graph where instead of talking about ellipticity, what I'm talking about here is the difference in optical path. So delta n times the length. This is the actual physical quantity, which is relevant. And this quantity here is independent of wavelength, of number of passes, so that you could compare different experiments. So we compared all the experiments that were in, in the previous graph. And what you see, and this is the interesting thing, is that they all stand, each ex experiment works at a different frequency. We had a few tens hertz. The pulse magnets have 100 hertz. Vignato had a tenths of uh, fractions of a hertz. This was, uh, this was millihertz, yeah? and so on. But the interesting thing is that they all stand on some sort of a power curve, which is telling you that there's something common to all the experiments. The green dots here are the actual stati statistical limit, which should have been reached if the experiment was done properly. This is what's called the shot nose. It's just photon counting statistics. Okay, nobody reached this so photon counting statistics because there's an intrinsic, as I said before, there's a noise coming from the mirrors of all these experiments who are trying to use fabri barrel cavities, and there's nothing you can do about this. Okay, let me show you what we're talking about. Our sensitivity here in optical path difference, if you go and see what the values are, we're talking about two, three, 10 to minus 19 meters. That's 100,000, 10,000 times smaller than the nucleus of an atom. 
So this is the kind of optical path difference that we are trying to measure. This kind of optical path difference is the same that gravitational waves are trying to measure. And all of this, this, these numbers that are so small, are actually, the fact that we did not reach the shot noise is because you have what are called thermal noises. It's not thermal because you're heating it up with a laser. It's thermodynamics, okay? And the problem is the falling. Let me just show you very quickly. Let's talk about Brownian nose. If you have uh, a spring, and you have a spring, okay, at a certain temperature T, remember that each degree of freedom at a certain temperature contributes to the average energy by one half uh, K volts times the temperature. And this is feeding energy into your oscillator. And so you have an average squared movement of your of your of the of the spring. The spring is never standing still, it's always moving. There's nothing you can do about it. Now a mirror does exactly the same thing. You have a thickness here, this has a, a certain elasticity, Young's constant, but it's a, a, you can see it as if this was a spring. It has an effective uh, elastic constant, and so you have a movement of the surface of the mirror. It's always moving. There's nothing you can do about this. There are ways of reducing it, but this is, this is how it is. It actually depends on frequency. This goes with the square root of the frequency. But if you go and calculate for fused silica, which is one of the standard glasses that is used in optics, one of the better glasses that you can find, we're talking about 10 to minus meters, 19 meters over square root hertz, which is exactly the limit that we have. So these are the kind of quantities. What is bothering us, though, is not so much this, it's this, which is actually a different source, but in the end, the, the, the quantities are the same. There's another thermodynamic result, and it's the following. If you have any volume, so first you define uh, a characteristic length of propagation of, of heat. Okay, this depends on frequency, but I'm not going to go into it. So you have a certain characteristic length. This defines a volume R cubed. This quantity here, Boltzmann constant times temperature squared divided by the density and the specific heat capacity of your medium. This quantity here, for thermodynamic reasons, has a fluctuation of variance in temperature. If you have a small volume and you measure the temperature, it's never constant. It always has a small variance. If you have a small variance, you multiply this by the expansion coefficient and you have a small movements of your, of your system. These movements, what do they do? They produce stress. If you take a piece of glass and you push it from the side and you try to shorten it, it produces stress. And stress makes birefringence. And so this is what we are seeing here. What we are seeing is that if you have the stress in two different perpendicular directions, you generate a birefringence. And this is what killed us. Okay. And again, the numbers are 10 to minus 19 meters. And gravitational wave antennas also have the same problem as we do. They also have this biofringence problem. So what did we do? Am I going too long? No. I guess I'll, I'll be quick. Now. So we tried to uh, work around this problem by trying to, uh, well, these, these are the choices you have. Either you try and make the frequency of your signal higher, but to, to improve sufficiently, to be able to measure, we have to rotate the magnets at 30, 30 times what we were doing. We were rotating about 10 hertz, 300 hertz, this is unthinkable, okay? So this was excluded. We tried to cool the mirrors. One thing is you can make mirrors cold. So this is, we worked on this for two or three years, okay? Uh, to try to reduce the temperature, we tried to go, we went down to 100 Kelvin. It was too difficult to do. We weren't, we didn't succeed. It was a mess. And so in the end, we gave up. So we thought that this was not possible because not only we weren't able to work at 100 Kelvin, but you would need to go down to liquid helium. So this, uh, this did not work, so we abandoned that. The other option is to increase the magnetic field and the length. And so we said, but what happens if we use one LHC dipole magnet, a superconductor, and that has 10 Tesla. And if you multiply V squared times L, this is 1,200 Tesla square meters. What we have downstairs is just 10, so it's more than 100 times more. Now, the question here is that the magnetic field of the LHC cannot be rotated or modulated. It's static. It has to be still. You can't do anything. It's a 15-meter magnet. It's just tons of 
and then you have uh, super fluid helium going through it. It's nothing you, you cannot do anything to it. So instead of changing the field, what we decided to do was rotate the polarization inside the magnetic field. So this we proposed to CERN. It was an experiment called, where is it? Is it maybe here? No. Okay. It was called VMB at CERN. We proposed this to CERN. They, they started uh, uh, following us. So the collaboration started and we started discussing with CERN to try to use the magnet. Uh, they would have given us the magnet. That as I'll show you in a moment, things didn't go the way we wanted to. So the idea is to rotate the polarization. So what do you do? You polarize her. You have the cavity, which are these two. And then inside the cavity, you try to rotate the polarization by rotating a half wave plate. These two will rotate at exactly the same frequency together. So you go, come here, and I'll explain why these are inside in a moment. You go inside the Fabri Perot. Here, the polarization is rotating, so it rotates inside the field. When it reaches the second wave plate, it stops rotating, and then it comes out of the system, and then again, you have all the rest of the optics is exactly what we had before. So there is no difference. So this is what we proposed. This is what we worked on. Clearly, by putting these two elements inside the Fabri Perot, uh, what happens is that the Fabri Perot, as I showed you before, the very, very high multiplication factor comes because the mirrors have a very high reflectivity. So reflectivity means that it has very low losses. If you want reflectivity 10 ppm parts per million, it means the losses are parts per million. If you put something inside the Fabri Perot, you get losses of 10 to minus 4. So there's no way in this system you can have such a high number of uh, passes. But in principle, that's not a problem because we were not limited by the number of passes. Uh, this is too, too many details. But so the idea was to put these wave plates inside. Now they're inside because you cannot rotate the polarization on the mirrors. This is an important fact. You must have the polarization fixed on each of the two mirrors. They cannot be rotated because the mirrors themselves have a big birefringence. They would give you kill all the signals. So you have to go inside. So this is what we worked on for a few years. And uh, just to show you that if it did work, if it had worked, this is the expected signal in optical path difference now at CERN with an LHC magnet. It's 10 to minus 21 meters. The curve I showed you before on the sensitivity, this one back here, this one here can be described approximately with this function here, 2.6, 10 to the minus 18. It depends on the frequency. And if you want to determine how long it would take you to make a measurement, you have to take the ratio of this to this, and then you have to square it. And this gives you a time. So if you impose, for example, 12 hours time of measurement, this is statistics. You try to, by counting the photons which you're accumulating, the, the relative noise goes down as one over the square root of the time. This is just statistics. Huh? If you impose about 12 hours of measurement, what you find is that indeed you would need to modulate the wave plates at 3 hertz and you would need to have this sensitivity. I don't want to go into the details here, but it's shown here in the graph. This is the curve before at 3 hertz. This is where we would, would have been, a few hertz. This blue line is the curve, which is the statistical limit in the case you have a very low finesse, so low number of passes, okay? And this is a st statistical limit which can be reached when you have low number of passes. And this statistical limit is achievable if you have certain conditions here, 100 milliwatts, 450 passes, wavelength, and so on, which is something quite standard. This is nothing special about it. So in principle, we should have been able to do this. And so we worked on it for some time. The technique actually works. This is just to show you that we measured, now instead of helium, we measured the Cotomuton effect in nitrogen, but it works very well. So the actual scheme works. The problem that came up was that if you use the cavity, you put the wave plates inside the cavity, it resulted more than complicated. It was a huge noise, okay? There was no way, you did not, you did not gain what the, 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 the multiplier should have made you gain. We were way off, okay? And there were, it was not feasible. It was just not feasible, so we stopped, okay? But, and this is the point, without the cavity, the method works, it's here. 
And you can easily measure biorefringences of the order of 10 to minus 8. And this is, this is, uh, this is the last slide. This is the reason why we entered this year, we entered Einstein Telescope collaboration. We entered because, as I said before, gravitational wave antennas have the same problems we have. Einstein Telescope is a huge collaboration, has a lot of people who've been doing all sorts of research on new materials and so on. And so the hope is that uh, we have a common source of noise that originates from thermal noise in the mirror coatings, okay? The actual part that reflects. And so, where is the synergy? So there's synergy basically between us and gravitational wave antennas. We both need the same expertise in developing new coatings to reduce the noise in the interferometers and in our experiment. And so what we had proposed by entering the collaboration is to use our polarimeter to measure the optics that will be built in the Einstein telescope. So we can measure the problem which afflicts all sorts of gravitational wave detectors. We measure them in a small lab so that we can help them develop the different materials for the substrates, different materials for the coatings and so on. And my hope is that someday a new coating will come up that has much lower noise. And then we can take one of these mirrors, two of the mirrors, and redo P2 last with lower noise. Because the system was not limited by the technique. It was limited by the noise in the mirrors. If you have better mirrors, maybe we can succeed. I don't know. So that's the end. Maybe. I don't know. It may not be the end. <laughs> After many, many years. But... Voila. Thank you. Thank you. you have questions? Yes. Thank you for the, for the nice talk. Mm. What about the pressure? Uh, it's not, re it's not uh, really an issue that there is no fuel vacuum. Is exactly. So the reason. The, this is something that's, how do I say, it's uh, irrelevant. Uh, it's difficult to study. In, in Normally, you don't study this in, in, uh, in a physics course. Uh, the Cotomuton effect is the effect of a magnetic field on a gas. Okay, It makes it birefringent. And you have to measure this coefficient. Each gas has its own coefficient. By measuring the coefficients of different gases, this tells you what is the pressure that you need to have inside the vacuum so that the QED effect, the vacuum fluctuations effect, is larger than the Cotomuton effect. Okay? So this is why you calibrate with gases, you test your system with gases, because this is what you need to do. Okay? The, the dangerous gases, fortunately, are things like nitrogen, oxygen, methane. These are effects, gases that have a large Cotomuton effect, but these are very easy to pump. These are pumped extremely well. Gases which are more difficult to pump are the noble gases, helium, argon, and so on. But fortunately, the photomotor effect of these gases is very small. So even if you have not such a good vacuum in partial pressure of noble gases, it's okay. This is, uh, for example, here in the limiting pressure is 10 to minus 5 millibar, which is not a problem. Oxygen, you need 10 to minus uh, 11 or 12 millibar partial pressure. But this is also not a problem. The pump switch can do this easily. So the, the gas, the residual, residual gas is easy. Other questions? I don't understand why you don't want to enter the Einstein telescope. Why? Why would this interest to enter the telescope? Why my interest with Einstein telescope? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to talk about Virgo for a moment. Okay, Virgo is the interferometer which is now in Pisa and Cascina. Um, they're having a lot of problems to reach the sensitivities that they were expecting to reach. Having a lot of problems, and they're beginning to suspect that not only do they have this problem, this is the most natural problem in the gravitational wave detector. The gravitational wave detector is measuring the length of an arm. So if you have the surface moving, you have a noise in the length. It's direct, okay? What they did not consider is this. 
the fact that if you have fluctuations inside the plane of the mirror, then you're changing the index of refraction. And when the light goes through this thin layer of reflective coating, you have also a variation in the optical path length, which is exactly the same thing, okay? Now, they're beginning to suspect that in their mirrors, they have this problem. Einstein telescope, which needs to be 10 times better than Virgo and then LIGO, they have a huge problem with this. And we have the same problem. And so we have a technique. We have What we did here is useful. So nobody does this for them. Nobody measures biofringences in, in the gravitational wave community. And so I said, okay, well, we, we can do this for you. And so we entered the collaboration of Einstein telescope to do these measurements for them. Not only the coating, but also the pieces of glass. Kagra is the interferometer, which is in Japan. This is a, a, another interferometer where they try to have cold mirrors. And to make cold mirrors to increase, to reduce this, to reduce the temperature, they say, we'll make cold mirrors, 20 Kelvin. So they did. But to be able to work at 20 Kelvin, you can't use fused silica anymore. I won't go to the details. So they use sapphire. So these uh, big mirrors like this of sapphire. Unfortunately, sapphire is very biofringent, and they cannot get their system to work properly because of the biofringence of the sapphire. And so they have to find a different way to, uh, if you want to use sapphire, you have to find a different way to grow the sapphire so that it's not biofringent, or at least you, you go along an axis where the biofringence is, is, uh, is uniform. And they're stuck. They really are stuck. They don't know what to do. They're trying to do all sorts of different things. So... There are two things we, 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 that the gravitational wave community needs from us. One is to measure the piece of glass, which can be sapphire, which can be silicon, which can be fused silicon, anything. Okay, this is what we will be doing. And the other thing is to measure the noise coming from the surface of the mirror, which is the standard is not good. So the things that are being uh, developed are crystalline mirrors. They want to develop new kinds of mirrors with different materials than the ones that are used until now. In particular, they want silicon and glass, silicon glass, silicon glass. All of these things. So we can do this. So you can develop with them the, yes, the mirror. Yes, exactly. But the, the experiment you can put stay here. The experiment stays here. Okay. <laughs> There's one in the, in the red floor and one in the underground. We have two, two apparatus. And each one will be dedicated to measuring the, the glasses and one will be measuring dedicated to measuring the noise. We have two, two systems. I remember when I was initiated with a French collaborator, the mirror from the military uh -huh. in the, the, the beginning. They At the very the beginning. Room. Because then in France, they, they built an entire lab dedicated to making the mirrors and the coatings. It's in, in Lyon, LMA, it's called. And uh, they make incredible surfaces with it because you have to, do, one thing is making a small mirror of one centimeter. One thing is making something which is half a meter with the same uniformity. It's just, it's, but they, they can do this. They can do this. They can do this. But the problem remains that there's... No, they have, no, they're not flat. They have a regular... The curvature of order of the length of the of the cavity. So Virgo has three kilometers. Each arm is three kilometers. So the curvature is three kilometers. Now, how do you measure three kilometers radius of curvature? I don't know. And Einstein telescope would be 10 kilometers, 10 or 15. And you have to choose the right materials. And it's uh, we, this is where we come in. We help them choose the biofringence and the materials. Because then you have to define the axis, you have to put the mirror properly, it's a bunch of things. This is where we want to help them. And maybe one day the return will be to have a good mirror and we can do the measurement. Because at the moment, the way I see it, there are many proposals. In DAISY, they want to do the QED. And they want to try with the rotating wave plates. But the, I think they will never succeed. They have 200 meters of magnets. But the, one other problem that, that you find by working with these systems is that mechanical movements, the nanometers, produce noise which stops you. 
And so if you expect to be able to stabilize optics, every single optics on 200 meters without any sort of stabilization, I, I don't know how they're going to do this, but they, they're going to try. I don't think they'll succeed. That's why I'm okay. We'll wait for the mirrors and then we can do it here. It's okay. <laughs> Yeah. Why are actually these light bulbs less effective by the problem that you mentioned about the release? Okay, that, that's a good question. I don't know. But th there is one question is that nobody ever checked the, the polarization, the birefringence of the mirrors. Now, when you have a cavity, what you have to do is be very careful because you have to align the polarization. I don't know why in Virgo they have a big problem and in LIGO they don't. Did they maybe align them correctly somehow? Did they do something which I don't know? I don't know. This is something I don't know. Uh, the problem is, is that if you have... Because both LIGO and Vigo had their mirrors built by LMA in France. Same. Same company. Not company. It's a lab. They did the same mirror. Now, did they, when they mounted them, did they mount them in a different way, which produced a different biofringence in the coating? If these aren't aligned by the fringes, then you're in a mess because the laser beam inside does not maintain a pure polarization, it becomes elliptical. And this produces a mess. So, I, I, but I don't know. This is my suspect, but I don't know. I don't know why. They don't know either. They, they, they really don't know. And you have a question? Oh, yes. And as you mentioned, let's see. Um, is, there, is there any other problem you see in X rays? In x-rays, in x-rays, so they've been talking about this for a long time. Okay, there's a group, they want to use x-rays because x-rays, what happens is that you re reduce lambda. Automatically, you gain a factor 10,000. You go 10 kV, it's 10,000. Lambda of 1,064 nanometers in the infrared is reducing is one electron volt. So x-rays, 10,000. So you gain 10,000. Okay. Now, the problem, though, which I have never seen them discuss, is this here, where is it? Is this. They always publish measuring the square of the ellipticity. They never introduce a modulator, which can be even static, okay? I don't know if it's, maybe it's not possible to make a modulator in x-rays, I have no idea. But th this is the problem. They have to measure a much smaller number because they can only see the square. And they have to see the square as a function of the extinction. And the extinction in x-rays is good. 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus 10, this is feasible. But whether they can then measure p squared, there are proposals, they're starting to do this. They're, they're working on it. Okay. Any other questions? Curiosities? Yeah? Uh, I don't know if that doesn't make sense. Uh, instead of uh, increasing the quality of the mirror, uh, there is uh, some. Uh, does it make sense to change the setup of the experiment for uh, having uh, a really different setup for uh, decrease the uh, the effect that, that, that we saw that great problem in the mirror? Okay. One solution is, uh, for example, the, 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 the number of passes that we have results in 500 kilometers of, of, uh, of magnetic field. Maybe you could build a magnet 500 kilometers long. It's it maybe going to space. I don't know. I really don't know. But at the moment, the fact that you need to measure a phase difference between two polarizations yeah. Or you want to measure the difference in the index of refraction using Virgo, for example. Virgo could do this, or LIGO, or, or, or Einstein telescope. You have to build a magnet to go onto this interferometer. This is this was, we, we published a paper, it was in 2009, proposing to put a magnet on Virgo. This could be done also on Einstein telescope. But it's not so obvious because on, for example, on an Einstein telescope, the tube where the vacuum is is one meter diameter. And you, you have two choices. You either put the magnet inside the vacuum or outside with a big hole. But inside, 
you need to have a magnet which can go down to the pressures that they will want in Einstein telescope, which is 10 to minus 9 millibar. And to have something mechanical inside of this at 10 to minus 9 millibar is, is, I don't know if it's feasible. So you say, okay, I make a big one, a big hole, so that the tube goes through the hole. But then when you make a big hole, the field, magnetic field drops dramatically. So this would be another solution. Uh, I haven't thought of other solutions because the, the problem is not the technique. The technique is not limited. Uh, the phase noise that you have is not due to the technique itself. It's due only to the mirrors. But you need something to amplify the length. You have to do this. Otherwise, you need a strong magnetic field, but you don't have those. And the uh, cooking space for uh, increase the quality of vacuum and uh, decrease the temperature. Yeah, yeah, okay. Ah, no, the temperature. Huh. You, you could also try to re reduce the temperature. This is the other one. Yeah. You try to do it. And reduce the noise. Yeah. This is another possibility. Um, the other thing you could try to do is instead of using magnetic field, you can try, because the same thing happens, the bioframe is also with electric fields. But it's much more difficult to get really strong electric fields in this magnetic field. The, the, the actual parameter which is important in the biorefringence is the, is the energy density. So magnetic field, as I, I taught you, I don't know who, a few years ago, magnetic energy density is much higher than it is for the electric field. D squared over mu zero, two mu zero is in the magnetic field density. Mu zero is 10 to minus seven, 10 to minus six, so you have a large density. The electric field density in vacuum, you have epsilon zero in front of the square of the electric field. So it's tiny. So you need really, really large fields. And you're a bit at the limit. So nobody has actually proposed electric fields. So it's really difficult. Until now, nobody's come up with a solution. Nobody. Then I the same problem with mirror. Hey, Lisa, they use a completely different. They, they don't use mirrors. They have transponders. They 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 collect the light, a few sure. photons, and then they reproduce them that in phase. It's not a mirror. Not a mirror. No, no. It's too little the light. They don't have enough light. They 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 take the, the light, they measure, and they re-emit with the with the transponder back. It's, it's completely different. I don't know how it works. Don't ask me. <laughs> Five million kilometers. I just don't know. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't know. I've never looked at that, actually. I don't know. I would have it. it could be looked at. I don't know. I don't know. You have to be able to measure the phase within 10 to minus 19 years. Okay, I don't know. This could be looked at. I have no idea. In that case, the baseline counts, doesn't it? For, for gravitational wave antennas? Yes. yes so because it's, 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 it's the, the, the noise divided by the length. So these have 5 million kilometers. So you don't need to have 10 to minus 19 meters in sensitivity. You can do much, much more. Yeah. So the problem is extracted the modulator. The problem is? In X-rays, there's the modulator, yes. But not only modulator, if you have a way of, of putting even a static electricity. So with the modulator, you want to change from linear to a digital? No, even a small amount. The modulator that we use here is 10 to minus 3. It's very small. You don't need much electricity. And you just need to be able to measure it. Huh? Why does this rain not... Uh... I don't know. I don't know enough. I tried to look at one point, uh, Frontera. With crystal, you can change from linear to superpolarized. With what? With using uh, linear with crystal. Oh, your crystals? Yes. Ah, so we I have to talk about gamma this. Gamma rays, but maybe you know, for like, so gamma rays. No, gamma rays is a problem then because you don't have a polarimeter. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this but is the other problem. Sure but with X-rays, you can because X-rays, you can do a, a polarizer just the way you use it here. You have a structure of crystals, and and you have ten to minus nine, ten to minus ten. You can do this sigma squared. But if you were able to have here something that you can add to your signal, which is either static or is modulated slowly, then you have the, the linearization, which would help a lot. Yeah, 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 we can talk about sure this. That, uh, okay. Can use the to change the... Okay. 
but I'm, I never thought about uh, X-ray. No, okay. Come back and we'll talk to each other. I will check. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <And> some, <laughs> okay. Maybe something that you didn't mention in the picture, that were, there were two magnets. Ah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this one here. So why do we have two magnets? This is another crystal point. You have two magnets because when you study systematics, okay, one of the most important systematics is what does the magnetic field do to the optics? Okay. If you have only one magnet and it's a permanent magnet, you can't turn off the field. You can't study the different, the, 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 the effect of your rotating magnet on the optics, even the mechanical problems. You can't study this. If you have two magnets, you can rotate them at 90 degrees. So magnet, one magnet is perpendicular. They stay always perpendicular. They rotate. And the magnetic effect, the real physical effect on the vacuum or on the gas or whatever you want to do, it cancels out. And so you have a zero measurement. Zero measurement means that you have them rotating perpendicular. And when you, you, you do your measurement, you must find zero. If you find a signal, something is wrong. You have a systematic, and you have to find it. So the two magnets is necessary for them. It's not just to lengthen the field. It's really, it's a physical problem. You have to have a zero field effect. This is done with two magnets. OK?